Now I would like to invite to the stage Aleksandra Przekalińska, Research Fellow at MIT Sloan School of Management. Aleksandra Przekalińska. Um, hello and good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation and the possibility to talk about humans and uh, robots. I wouldn't like us to think about this as a conflict because human versus robots may imply that we are in a situation of conflict or upcoming conflict. I really think that this doesn't have to be the case. This is not necessarily the case. And today I would just like to tell you uh, why. So I decided to entitle this presentation, Don't Be Afraid of Robots. And this is something that I've been trying to push through, a message that I've been trying to push through for uh, a few years now of my work. Um, I'm working uh, here at Kosminski University and uh, here in Warsaw, I mean in Poland, and uh, at MIT at the Center for Collective Intelligence, where we work with uh, various wearable technologies. Uh, we work on human-computer interaction, and also we're kind of tracing all the digital traces that people leave behind in order to understand how they kind of behave online and also to a certain extent to, to predict how they can behave in the future. And I know this all can sound a bit scary, uh, but I hope to kind of maybe persuade you not to think about it uh, that way. So as said before, don't be afraid of what robots and um, I'll just try to show you a bit why we are possibly afraid now and what could we do in order not to be uh, afraid in the future. So um, first of all, I would like to say that according to everything that we have done, all the projects that our team has done, it's okay to be afraid of robots uh, in the first place. Um, they can be scary, and also I think popular culture is adding a lot to that fear that we already have because of Terminator, because of Ex Machina that was just shown before, right? So all these images of machines taking over the world are pretty scary. But there is another component. There is a component that is psychophysiological and possibly also evolutionary, which means that it's our internal fear that we have Right? And it's a fear of something that we cannot classify, that is neither human uh, and neither non-human. And it's really difficult to decide how to behave towards it. Right? And when you look at an image like this one, you can actually think, okay, this is really true. There is something wrong with this image. I wouldn't like to really interact with something like this. Uh, obviously, it's not only a fear of physical machines. It can also be a fear of virtual machines, such as virtual assistants or bots. We have lots of them right now. We have Siri. We have Alexa. We have Google Now um, and so many others, right? Uh, and I think that... Uh, all of these can also induce certain level of stress or fear, especially if you don't know with whom you're really interacting. If you have to ask yourself a question and constantly perform the Turing task, figuring out, are you, am I talking to a machine? Am I talking to a robot? What's really going on? Then you can feel really confused and, and worried about it. And this was something that we were uh, trying to address uh, in a research that we have just finished very recently. Uh, it's a research... Um, that is really looking at the user, which means we're not uh, really developing technologies, although we did create some toy models of, of bots for this research. But what we were really looking at and focusing on is the human and not the machine. So we were not asking ourselves a question, how to develop the best possible machine, but rather what the user really wants and how the user interacts with various types of bots. We are actually planning to scale this methodology also to physical machines, which means that soon we will be using also robots for that and uh, physical uh, objects. But for now, we have just focused on bots that interact with us using natural language online. So what have we done? We have collected various psychophysiological signals. We hooked up electrodes, and we have used uh, electromyography, uh, electrocardiogram, respirometer, and a few other um, ways of measuring the affect. So the way we emotionally to a certain extent, um, react to machines. And we also built a very detailed questionnaire where we have asked about, you know, would people like to interact with a machine like this in the future? Would they like to work 
with a machine like that in the future, meaning the bot that we have created. And uh, it was like a combined experiment where we had the first part related to psychophysiology, so our bodily reactions, reactions that we cannot control and reactions that we cannot declare anyhow, but that are definitely visible for, I don't know, neuroimaging techniques and so on. And we have combined that with the part where we asked people to assess if they would like to encounter such a technology in their workplace, in their house, and so on, or not. We have created a bot in two different versions. First one was just text-based, and the other one was uh, equipped also with voice, and there was an avatar, an animated figure that was interacting with people, which means that we had distinctively different channels of communication. In one case, we just had messages and text, and in the other one, we had voice, nonverbal communication, such as gestures, and also uh, the text component, right? So we had two different versions of bot, and then we have assessed the psychophysiological signals during the interactions. We asked people to talk to the bot for about, I would say, um, uh, 20 minutes or so, uh, and then we asked them to kind of start uh, assessing how they liked that interaction, uh, did they perform the task well, were they feeling comfortable, were they feeling threatened, and so on and so on. And then we combined that qualitative and quantitative data uh, together in order to understand uh, how people felt about it. So our kind of context for that research was probably something that you know. It's a, a fairly known psychological effect called the Uncanny Valley. Uh, it has never been fully explained, really. It's something that has been in the air. Um, a Japanese scientist called Mori discovered it um, three decades ago. And since then, there were only a few studies that really addressed it. And we thought that, well, now we're really at the point where we have to start addressing it because these interactions will be happening more and more often at the workplace, at home, right everywhere, basically. So as you can see, the uncanny valley pretty much means that there are certain machines with whom we will interact smoothly, and there are others that will be rejected, at least to a certain extent. Uh, and something like a humanoid robot or a prosthetic hand, a robotic hand, is something that still invokes certain fear. We are afraid of it. We don't know if it's alive or not. We are hesitant to interact with it. If we are um, somehow overwhelmed with stimuli from the machine, we are withdrawing, and we don't want to interact with it anymore. And it's something that is very... Uh, much about us humans and about our responses to uh, external environment and uh, an effect that is very difficult to get rid of. Uh, why are we also afraid? Well, there are a few other reasons to be afraid. For instance, right, uh, chaos and lack of control. The bots uh, may take over the world, right? This is uh, a general thing, but what's behind it? For instance, the fact that we don't have control over our data, and this is something that worries us, right? We are afraid that we're losing power. We are afraid that we're not going to be in charge anymore in the future. We are afraid that we're going to be unnecessary also in the future. Uh, and maybe we will lose the crown, right, of the kings of the world because machines will be better at something. Now, we are afraid of many different phenomena such as this one, right? Probably you know about Tai, uh, a very famous bot that was uh, an example of how you can shape public opinion on the basis of hate online, basically. It harvested a lot of knowledge from uh, various controversial statements online and then sent it on Twitter to other users, right? So this is all, a lot, it has a lot to do with politics, but also the influence of machines on us, right? So what can we do is... Um, I think a very relevant question right now. Well, I think we should not be afraid. That's the first thing. This fear is in us. Some of that fear has to stay, but some of the fear we have to let go. Um, for instance, we will get used to our technologies, right? In the future, when we have more interactions with technology, some of that psychophysiological fear will just go away, right? We will j reject some of it too, and that's okay, because some of it will not be good enough to interact with us. But it is true also, as you can see, that the uncanny valley is not over, which means the uncanny valley changes, right, as a phenomenon. When we are exposed to more technologies, we're less afraid of it also, and we get used to it, such as voice technology, for instance. We used to be afraid of it. We didn't want to do it. Now, we're accepting it more. 
Um, what is more, we can be safe online, we can be safe with our data if we collectively improve our digital skills, right? It's very relevant to understand this whole landscape for everyone. We have to start with education, obviously, of the kids, digital natives, that are just entering the world. They need to understand everything that's going on in there and they need to have skills in order to understand it and follow up, right? And understand how the machines are working too, understand their logic. Um, also, I think there is something about us that we should discuss, the fact that we are very much afraid of losing that kingdom of ours, right? Maybe it's not the proper approach. If we have assistive technologies that are helping us out, optimizing certain processes, this is also a good thing, right? So being afraid of it is actually maybe just very much egocentric about us, right? Maybe we can also transform ourselves to a certain extent. Maybe we should try to think about ourselves as something that will soon merge with technology, get enhanced by technology, and not something that will just lose jobs be because of technology. So I think in the general uh, uh, context, we could start thinking about the world in a bit different way. And this is a picture that I just came up with, uh, you know, fish in the air. Why not? Uh, maybe we should start think, thinking about ourselves also in a different paradigm. Not the paradigm of those who rule the world, but those who want to make it better and are using technologies in order to do so. Um, what we can also do is we can collect a lot of data. So the job market is changing, but really I think nobody now has very uh, precise data about what's going on with the job market and automation. I think there are some charts and there are some, you know, reports, but uh, we need to make a bigger effort in order to understand how these processes are going, which jobs will stay longer, which will stay shorter, in order to prepare ourselves for that big paradigmatic uh, change. So generally, I think that we should not get rid of te technology, and even if we try to do so, somebody else will develop it anyway. We can agree here in this room that we are getting rid of technology, we're stopping this process, we don't want no AI, and so on. But this is not the way to go. So I think in order to have a better future with technologies, we just need to start living uh, and loving it. Thank you. <laughs>